two ordinances the Lord wanted us to follow. Those two are baptism and the Lord's Supper. These two are commandments. God commanded us to, to do that. Today I'm going to preach to you about resolutions for the new year. The back of your bulletin you have the outline and Miss Beverly prayed for the family that I'm leaving behind, my wife and children. The only thing you got to pray, Miss Beverly, that Shelly won't fire many of her workers. When I'm gone, the way that <laughs> they're giving trouble. And also for Mr. Calvin. He's 97. He's got his license renewed. He's happy. He's driving to church. So pray that, uh, you know, he is safe. Uh, that's another worry I have and I leave. I shouldn't say worry. I have concern. Um, but God has been so good to him, protecting him. And pray that uh, God will protect him, continue to protect him. All right. Uh, this being the first Sunday of this brand new year, I chose a topic that is resolutions for the new year. When I get back from my trip, I would begin or I would resume the journey of the people of Israel. We stopped it because of Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'll get back into it. I know you'll be blessed by Brother Jim while I'm gone. But today, resolutions for the new year. I'm sure that you all have made some resolutions for the new year. These are some common resolutions people make every year. Let me go down the list. Exercise more. Lose weight. Get organized. Learn a new skill or a hobby. Save money. Spend less. Quit smoking. Quit drinking. Sp spend more time with the family. Read more. Spend le less time on social media. Cook good dinners for my spouse was, of course, Miss Paula's resolution that. And then uh, uh, quit e eating unhealthy food. These are some of the resolutions that, that people make. But I want to tell you the Forbes Health Magazine polled people. In their polling, this is exactly what they found. It may not shock you, but it's quite interesting. They said, all resolutions by most people will last only three to four months. Only three to four months. And they broke it down. So only 8% would keep that resolution. I should say only 8%, yeah. Uh, keep only for one month. By the end of January, it's gone for 8%. 22% would last for another month, two months. Another 22%, another month, third month. And then 13% for the fourth month. By then, most of them are done. Maybe less than 1% would keep their resolutions, at least one, till the end of the year. I don't know why people make resolutions. I stopped making those resolutions because I know I can't keep it. Uh, the excitement of resolutions would die out by the end of January. But I, I, I'm here to preach to you that God gave us some resolutions that we're supposed to make every day. I began to read more of this Forbes report. The reason why people fizzle out, they stated mundane daily routine and cares of this life. As they get busy, as they, ta as they take more and more burden, they forget about the resolutions. You translate that into our spiritual life. For the same reason, people would not keep some of the spiritual resolutions they are supposed to keep. See, the resolutions we make in our life or, you know, it is, it is choice. Uh, our own choice. We keep it or don't keep it. Who cares, right? But some of these resolutions I'm going to give you is from the Word. Seven of them. Perfect number. 
I will give it to you quickly if you're listening to me. Write it down, and I pray that you'll be able to keep this resolution all through this year. The first one is this. Resolve to call upon God, pray, and seek Him. Resolve to call upon God, pray, and seek the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 13. For thus says the Lord, When seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promises, and bring you back to this place, that is to Jerusalem. And then, the very famous Bible verse, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me, and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me, and find me, when you seek me with all your heart. Now the history behind this is this. Jeremiah is writing a letter to the people in exile in Babylon. They were in captivity, 70 years, and they were thinking about the promised land. Who? The people of Israel. Jeremiah is writing to them saying that, I know you've had bad moments. I know you have had sad moments. I know you had many disappointments. I know you had many failures. I know you are now under captivity. But I'm writing this to you when the 70 years are done. God will take you. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to call upon the name of God. And I want you to... to What's that? Let's keep going. All right. Uh, that's okay. And it, as it goes on, and uh, I don't know what to do with that. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but it's set on. You want a laptop? No? Okay. All right. And there seemed to be some technical thing. And uh, so as it goes on, I'll, say, I'll tell you, you probably have all the notes. Don't try to take it. Just listen to me so you can take the outline. Okay, and here it is. I thought I corrected that. I, I watched that in this morning, and I corrected that, and hopefully I didn't go through. But nevertheless, you just listen to me. Don't, don't follow that, and I'll give you all the outline. Okay, and this is exactly what Jeremiah meant. In 2023, you may have had disappointments. You may have had failures. You may have had sad times. You may have had bad times. What he's saying, God knows everything. It's gone. When that 70 years ended, you would call upon God. You seek Him. Pray. Now, can, can that be stopped, Daniel? Scrolling? Okay, can you take the PowerPoint completely out? And nothing, just leave the blue screen up. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So that way, uh, you would hear me and then put the PowerPoint. Sorry about the technical difficulties. It, uh, we'll, we'll go with it. No, I, I corrected it, and I don't know why, what happened. When you correct that, it has to translate. Uh, I don't know why it did not translate. But that's okay. Oh, you listen to me, I'll give you the outline. You're online, you just listen to me, and then take the outline. The first thing is call upon God. Call upon God. Seek Him. Seek His face. Second resolution, before I get into that, I want to tell you, there are times that we are so preoccupied. Remember, Forbes said, the cares of this world, your mundane duties, takes your time away. And make sure you don't spend time on TV or your laptop or, or social media Take the time out. Spend time with God. Make a resolution to do that. Secondly, resolve to serve God with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. 
Let me emphasize that again. Resolve to serve God with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. Wholehearted devotion and willing mind. Let me read 1 Chronicles 28.9. David is writing this information to his son Solomon. This is what he writes. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, underscore that, if you forsake him, he will cast you out, cast you out, cast you off forever. Now David, he knew what it means to be forsaken by the Lord. He knew what God would do when you forsake him. So he was instructing his son Solomon, hey Solomon, you're going to build the temple, but this is what I want you to remember. Your heart should be wholeheartedly devoted to God. For him not to, not to cast you off. And I want your mind to be settled on God. And I want you to make a resolution, Solomon, that your mind will stay on God. And then David is writing later on, Psalm 139, O oh Lord, you search me, you know me. When I sit down, when I rise up, you know me. My thoughts are not far from you. You search my path. My path. You, you know my lying down. You know my getting up. You know everything. Even before I could utter something in my mouth, you know it all. See, Christian life is not a life of convenience. It is not that we have some extra time we can give it to God. It is not that we go to church when we feel like going to church. The COVID made a mess. Is that people are now taking a choice. And people are trying to give extra time to God, not all the time to the Lord. David is warning his son Solomon. He's saying God is omniscient. You can't hide anything from God. Therefore, I want you to wholeheartedly devote your time to God. Reading the Bible, praying, going to church. Don't go away from it. When, once you go away, and He's going to cast you off. It's a warning. You know, the word omniscient is a Latin word. It comes from two Latin words, actually. Omnis means all. Scientia means knowledge. So, omnis means all, scientia means knowledge, which means God knows everything about you, your heart. You cannot hide anything from God. So make a resolution in this new year, 2024, that you would serve God wholeheartedly with willing mind. Number three, resolve to cast your burden upon the Lord. Resolve to cast a burden upon the Lord. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. The fill in the blanks there is resolve to cast your burden upon the Lord. There are three things Unfortunately, would follow you, follow me, in this brand new year. That ain't going to go away. Those three things are anxiety, worries, and concerns. It's not going to go away. As long as we live in this sinful body, we will have these three. Anxiety, worries, and concerns. Part of our life. And then the psalmist David is saying here is that the Lord will sustain you. In other words, He will be with you, help you to go through your anxious moments. Help you to go through your moments of weariness. He will help you to go through your times of concern. 
Then Peter is writing New Testament, 1 Peter 5, 7, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Why does God want us to cast our burdens on him? Because he knows we can bear it alone. Sometimes we do. I remember very clearly years and years ago, I should say, at least about 20 years ago, I was pastoring First Baptist Church of Savage. One Sunday, I gave this sermon, and I put a cross, wooden cross, up front, and a basket by the cross, and asked people to write down their concerns and their worries. Whatever they want to give it to the Lord, I want to come and put it in the basket. Don't take it back. And I said that symbolically because this is exactly what Christians would do. They would pray. They would spell out the anxieties they go through in their lives. Come to the cross. All that is good. After prayer, they take it right back with them. You don't leave the burden and take it back. Give it to God. Because He cares for you. He said, lean on me. Well, once you give it to me, you don't have to take it back. Work with me. God said, I'm with you. I'll sustain you. God's promise in 2024 is that whatever anxiety that you would go through, whatever worries that would creep into, into your mind, whatever concerns that you have for your family, God said, I'll sustain you. You may have concerns about your spouse, of your children, of your neighbors, of your church member, or your friends, or whoever that might be. And I want you to give that person that particular problem or extended families to God. He said, I'll sustain you. You can't bear it alone. Most often than not, we bear the burdens alone. We think that God is up there and I prayed and, and gave it to Him, but we never gave it to Him. I go through the same moments like you all. I pray and I won't give it. And then God reminds me again, hey, what's the point of praying? You know how God, how God remi reminds me? When I go and open the Bible again to, to prepare my sermon or something like that, I would come into a Bible verse that would speak to me clearly saying that you said you gave, but you didn't. And God said, give it to me. Resolved to give our burdens, our cares to the Lord in 2024. Don't take it back. Number four. Resolve to love God and one another. Resolve to love God and one another. That's a resolution that you and I would want to take in this brand new year. And I want to read this particular Bible verse. I don't know whether you have ever looked at this Bible verse from a different perspective. I want you to follow me as I read John 13, 34. The Gospel of John 13, 34. A, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also ought to love your brothers or love one another. Now, do you notice that one? Is that a new commandment? It is not. The what Jesus is saying, it is a new commandment. I want you to think with me. The very first time that we read, God said you should, you should love your God and love your neighbor, it's way back in the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18. He said, you shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own, but you shall love your neighbors as yourself. I am the Lord. He already said that in the Old Testament. And then again in Deuteronomy 6, 5, Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor. It's not new. Then why Jesus said, I give you a new commandment? What is the point in God emphasizing it is a new commandment? Just one phrase would make this a new commandment. Although it's an old commandment. That one phrase is this. The Lord said, 
love your neighbor as I have loved you. That's I have loved you is the new phrase. Jesus demonstrated his own love. Just I have loved you. In other words, I want you to demonstrate the love that I have for you to your fellow brethren. You know, quite often than not, we don't see others through the lens of Jesus. We don't. If God had to use the lens to see me, I would not be preaching here, standing and preaching here. God does not use any lenses. God does not use any filters. God does not use any blinders. He sees me like I'm being seen through the camera. Just as I am. That's why I love the good old hymn. Just as I am without one plea. God knows you. God sees you. And He forgives you. When Jesus said, I want you to love your neighbor, love your brother, as I have loved you, which is the new phrase He added to it, I want you to be reminded how much I love you. I don't, I don't see you with all your faults, Paul. I don't hold your background. I don't hold 2023 against you. It's a brand new year. I see you as you are. I love you anyway. God says, I love you anyway, regardless of what you've been through, what you are. And the Lord said to the disciples, as I have loved you. If God had to put filters to love his disciples, God would not have loved any one of them. All twelve, one betrayed and gone. All the others, and later on one joined, they all had their ups and downs. But God said, I love you. Then God said, greater love, no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. Love one another, as God has loved us. Make a resolution this year that you would love others unconditionally as God in Christ loves us. Now, the other person might not receive your love favorably. That, that's not your job. See, God loved everybody equally and whether or not they reciprocate the love, it's not of God's concern. He said, I want to love you. That's why I died for you on the cross of Calvary. And I want you to reflect that love to one another. So resolve in your heart that you would love the Lord, love one another as Jesus loved you. That's a new phrase, as I commanded you. And number five. Resolve to make better choices. The fifth resolution that we want to make together, I want to make, Resolve to make better choices. First King, chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. My wife Shelley and I were on top of Mount Carmel. <laughs> where Elijah challenged the Baal worshippers. King Ahab, the ungodly, heathen king of Israel. He said, I'm going to send 450 Baal priests, worshippers, to challenge Elijah. Elijah was on Mount Carmel. These Baal worshippers gathered. Elijah was really righteously indignant we need some righteously indignant people in our country now. Christians, Christian leaders, we need to be righteously indignant. The liberals are taking hold of everything. Before you know it, they'll come after churches, folks. They already are coming after churches. Better wake up. And we need to act like Elijah. Elijah spoke to the people of Israel. 450 bill worshippers and scores of other Israelites gathered to see the spectacle on Mount Carmel. Elijah 
with this might said, Hey, listen to me. He said, Come near to me. If you want to serve the Lord, say so. If you don't want to serve the Lord, get out of here. So whomever you want to, make a choice. Joshua made the same choice. He told the people of Israel, saying that, Do you want to worship the gods of Amorites, the gods of the Egyptians, or the gods that you left behind? Go ahead and worship. Or if you want to come with me to the promised land, worship God. But as for me and my, and my family, I will serve the Lord. Make a determination. Make a choice as a family to serve God. And to, to be His servant. You know, there's, there are too many Christians today who have a form of godliness. There's a whole bunch of worldliness inside. Outside, they're godly. But inside, they're worldly. That tells me that you cannot ask your right foot to go west, left to east. You can't walk that way. We got to walk together. So some people say, hey, I'm going to church, I'm a Christian, my right foot. But I'm in the world, my left foot is going the other direction. You cannot walk. That's a wrong choice. James is writing in James 4. Go ahead and read that James 4, 4 through 10. Be not double-minded. Either you're with God, or just like Elijah said, make a choice, or you're not with God. Either you're a Christian, or not a Christian. Don't try to vacillate between the two. And he is comparing, who James is comparing, this double-mindedness to waves of the ocean. Quite often, I tell you, the waves of the ocean are boisterous, powerful. Lately, those waves have been more powerful than people can handle in California. I think they need more waves. Sorry about that. My cousins, my niece and nephews live there. But you, you know, the guys in California have to repent. Otherwise, God is going to send about 30 feet or 40 feet of, in a surf coming there. Hollywood, watch it. But, because, but this powerful waves are not useful for anything. You cannot generate hydroelectric power through that power. No, because they're unstable in all the waves. And if your ways are unstable, James is saying you are not useful. So make the right choice in your life. Just like Elijah said. Alright. After making the choice, in life we make choices, right? Every day we make choices. And I'm going to give you some practical advice with scriptural background. And when you make choices in life, I want you to think about the, these three things. The first thing is, when you make a choice, whatever that might be, is the choice in, in agreement with God's Word. Fill in the blanks is agreement. The choice that I'm making, whatever choice that I'm making, is that in agreement with God's Word? Could be a simple choice. Check with the Word. The word is in conflict with the choice that you're making, you are making the wrong choice. The second thing is make this choice and then think about will this help me to become a better person? A better person, fill in the blanks. See, most people are not making choices between good and evil. You know, some, some do. And they said, I'll make a choice to become evil. You know there are some people I watched on TV these days boldly say, I don't care going to hell. And that surprised me. They don't know what hell is all about, right? And if they do know, some of them do know, do you know that so much of quotes that come on the social media are quotes from the devil? They say, we worship devil? Very boldly. So those are choices between good and evil. Just like I just said, they made the choice to go after the devil. That they will meet the Lord of the judgment and God would say, No, you're not, and throw them in hell. Sorry about that. That's the verdict from the Word. But good choice. Now, 
what we do, we make better and best choices in life. That's the choice I'm making. The choice that you're making, and I want you to know whether that would make me a better person, that I make a best choice. Now, you, you all go to the grocery store, don't you? And we, we go to the uh, cereal section. I don't go to Wegmans, but I've been there once in, in Hunt Valley. That was the only time I went. I went to get tea. I went to the, the section of tea. I'm not exaggerating. You go. They probably have about 50 different variety of tree, tea there. It will confuse you. Then go to the cereal section. They probably would have 50 plus. Mr. Kalaw came up with, uh, you know, one or two in the beginning. I love that. But today they have all kinds of cereal. But not all of them are good for me. When I go there, I love the sugar-coated Wheaties. I love it. But I don't buy it. I love sugar-coated, you know, uh, anything sugar-coated. But I can't. Because that's bad for me. I'm, I'm diabetic. So, so let's be listening. Type 2. And some of you are here, you know it. We, we crave for sweet. And we go after that. But when I see that, I say, oh, I need to make a better choice. That would help me. So I don't, I don't take that. So what would make me a better and healthy person is that if I make a better choice. Always think about the choices you make. By making this choice in my life this year, would that make me a better person? First, whether it agrees with God's word. Secondly, whether it would make me a better person. Thirdly, will this choice harm anyone else? Will this choice harm anyone else? Because we live in a self-seeking, what is in for me generation. So when you're going through what is in for me generation, they trample on you. And so sometimes we do the same thing. What is good for me? And I'm going to make that choice. You don't worry about anyone else. Sometimes people even worry about their spouses. This is my way, and I want you to get on this way. That's not the right choice. Even though sometimes the choices you make may be good for you, as you think, but it's not the right choice. I want to give you a Bible verse. Write it down. 1 Corinthians 10.23. 1 Corinthians 10.23. i got two more resolutions. I'm done. All right? 1 Corinthians 10.23. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. What Paul is saying, I can make any choice that I want. But not every choice is permissible. Even though it's permissible, it's not beneficial. Every choice is permissible, but not constructive. It's not going to build anybody. Therefore, when you make choices in 2024, think about these three things. Whether this one, the Word of God, agrees with your choice. Number two, are you making a better choice for yourself? Number three, would it harm somebody? All right. Let me go to number number six. Resolve to bear fruit for Jesus. Resolve to bear fruit for Jesus. Only a healthy plant will produce good fruit. Your outward action is the indication of your inward self. The fruit that you're bearing tells you the kind of person that you are. What God is saying is that you and I are called to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. God wants us to bear the fruit. But then He also is saying that you cannot bear that alone. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, you will bear fruit much more. And then the scripture says, without me, John 15, 4 and 5, without me, you can do nothing. So God wants us to bear fruit for Him in this new year. Resolve to make good fruits, or bear good fruits for the Lord Jesus. Now listen to this. 
If the branch is cut off, you're not going to bear any fruit. You're not going to get the energy. You're not going to get anything from the root, from the, from the, from the trunk of the tree. And the only thing that people will do is cut you off. Because you are barren. So God wants us to be connected with Him in this year. Be grafted into the vine. I'm the vine. You are the branches. The Lord said, I want you to be connected. Without me, you can do nothing in this new year. I want you to know, in 2024, you and I cannot do anything without Jesus. Bear fruit. Number seven. Resolve to go or send. Now this phrase, go or send, is not the phrase that I coined. This is based on the great commission of the Lord, Matthew 28, 19, and Mark. This phrase was coined by a distant relative of mine, an uncle who is no longer here on earth. He established a missionary movement called French Missionary Prayer Band. I was a little kid. He would ask me to play the guitar. And he coined that phrase, go or send. What it means is that not all of us can go. We're all commanded, commissioned to go. But not all can go. Like you sent a team to go to Canada Town. The whole church can go. Either you go or you send. You send support. You send people. In my life, I have committed to go or send. My parents did that. And God has given this responsibility of carrying the good news to the world to us as Christians. God saved us. And He is in saving business. He wants us to go and share the good news of the gospel to everybody. Now you and I have no excuses. And I was going through the pictures of my missions and my ministry on the other day. I was so blessed to see we took a team to Mississippi. Mr. Betty was with me. Mr. Uh, Waller was with me. We were the first ones to go. As a result of that, we established a, a, a partnership. We had teams coming from Mississippi. First Baptist, if you're listening, the porch and the ramp built free of charge by the Mississippi mission team. Now that's go or send. And we took our, our people down there. I know uh, Billy Gano and Bonnie Grooms, they're all part of the mission team. Bless her heart. Kim Young, she went to be with the Lord, was there. Mitchell Young, a whole bunch of people. Then Mississippi, I have pictures of that. And then Appalachia, West Virginia, and Kentucky recently. Montana, New Mexico, Vancouver, Tennessee, Caribbean Island, Louisiana, Pennsylvania. Overseas, Africa, Middle East, Jordan, Israel, Pakistan, India, China. My goodness, when I looked at all those things, Lord. Yep. Turkey, yep, my wife remembers all that. Turkey too. There's so many countries and so many states within the United States. Vancouver, don't forget that. It's a foreign country too. Canadians are foreigners to us. My brother is a foreigner who lives in Canada. They have totally different rules and regulations. Jamie was with us. Yes. In one of those mission trips. And your mom was with us too. Ms. Rhonda was with us. And then uh, Jamie was a wonderful mission trip guy. David, have you ever been on a mission trip with me? You've got to think about that. Yes. And so many younger, probably not. So many younger people joined me. So many youth joined me. And, and, and we did so much of ministry. Go, go, go. Share the love of the Lord. Not every kid that went on mission to were preachers. Not every young people who led the team were preachers. Not every person went to the seminary. But why didn't they go? And some of you sent us. You financially supported us and sent us. And we're so grateful to all your help. Here it is. No excuse. I'm going to close with this. Paul the Apostle. He had nothing to his name. He was intellectual. He went to King Agrippa and debated with him. 
And Peter was an emotional guy. After Jesus rose again and, and showed him to his disciples, he went and talked. Acts of the Apostles. He said, you sinners, crucify the Lord. He was bold. God used him that way. Matthew never preached a single sermon that I do from the Word. He wrote the gospel, never preached. But Matthew did this. He threw a party and asked Jesus to come in and then sinners gather. You can do that. No excuse. And then Luke, Dr. Luke. And he never preached anything. He wrote the gospel and also the book of Acts. He was able to do that. It's because of that. If you're good in writing, oh my goodness, Miss Beverly, in, in First Baptist Church of Savage, I know there was a lady who used to write cards. Mrs. McBee. And then Mrs. Smith after that. And this little old lady from West Virginia and uh, went to be with the Lord. Her ministry was writing cards. And I think Miss Beverly got the gift too. And she writes cards so beautifully with her handwriting. That's ministry. Great ministry. And Dorcas, Tabitha, in the book of Acts, did the same thing. She did not write the cards. What she did is she started knitting stuff, knitting the blankets for the widows. She died, and everybody, every woman who got this, uh, this knitted thing went to Peter and said, Hey, she died. Please come and raise her up. We would have never heard about this woman, but for these women. So you and I have no excuse sharing the gospel of God. I want to share this one with you, and then I'm going to close. This morning I pulled into McDonald's. See, McDonald's is my favorite restaurant to get my coffee in the morning. And then I stopped by and got my large coffee. This heavy set lady, she could hardly speak English, but she does. Uh, very good and carry on conversation. Uh, you go to church, aren't you? I said, how do you know? I can tell you every Sunday morning you come and you're dressed up. Yeah, I am. And then uh, I asked her, do you know Jesus? I believe in God. No, I didn't ask you that. I said, what happened? Oh, no, I work. Okay, you should go to church. you have Bible? No, I don't have Bible. I, Jerry, I made a resolution that I would probably get a Latin Bible or Spanish Bible and give it to her. I said, would you go? Would you read the Bible? I said, yeah, my parents used to go. Why? She told me this. 20 years, I suffered a lot in my life. And I had this feeling. So, I said, no, no, no. God cares for you. I don't have time. But believe in the Lord, worship God. Okay, I'll think about it. And then, and then he said, uh, I won't be here for the next two, three weeks because you lose business because of me, right? Uh, and then when I come back, I get it's just little things like that. You can do that. I'm just saying that. A little conversation. Jesus loves you. You may see a person out there in the grocery store. Are you okay today? I said, no, well, Jesus loves you. That's all they need to hear. So in closing, make Jesus your priority in this year. Cast your cares on Him. Make the right choices. Be His witnesses. And then seek the Lord with all your heart. And He said, love one another as I have loved you. If you do all these wonderful resolutions that I have recommended, and I know this year it's going to be a blessing. And one more thing I want to tell you in close. You would see in the, the prayer gram a widow, a young widow. She was about to be pushed into prostitution because she's young, having two kids in India. And do you know one person compassionately? Your sister, Dala, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help this woman. That's gospel work. I know I've taken much of your time today, but I pray that God would make us witnesses for His name, whether here in Howard County, or in the state of Maryland, or across the borders of our state, or across the globe. Be His witnesses. Either you go or send. Touch somebody this year. Resolved to pray and worship God. With that said, let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Lord, as we come to this brand new year, Lord, I pray for myself that I would keep those seven resolutions that I recommended that we keep in this year. Lord, we have anxieties, cares of this world, worries, and yet you said, cast your care on me. 
Help us to cast everything on you. Pray for those who are listening to me. Perhaps they don't know the Lord Jesus. May they come to you. And they're Christians. Father, let not the world stop us from doing what we're supposed to do. Forgive us, Lord, and lead us. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for giving me 13 more minutes today. I will see you when I get back in town. Brother Jim would bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. God bless you.